Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Division of Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, the Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Donald McCulloch. He is uh, retired from the University of Illinois and is at the Weiss Earth Science Museum at the University of Oshkosh, the campus at the uh, Fox Valley in Appleton. Uh, he's going to talk with us about the impact of the Niagara Escarpment on the development of Wisconsin. As I said in my little missive today, we often say that things are not written in stone necessarily, but when it comes to the history and origins and development of Wisconsin, a lot really is written in the stones and the rocks that are beneath our feet and below the waves. I'm looking forward to hearing about this. Please join me in welcoming Don McCulloch to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you. I'm going to uh, talk about not only the escarpment. The escarpment is uh, slurring age rocks, but I'm going to talk about how something that happened 430 million years ago is actually still impacting us as we speak. Um, the Niagara Escarpment is just the thin edge of uh, Silurian rocks in, uh, in Wisconsin and of course many people know that there's a thing called the Escarpment in Wisconsin. Uh, they don't know much about it. They don't know why it's there. They know it has something maybe to do with uh, Niagara Falls. It's always kind of a mystery. It's, it doesn't have the same notoriety as places like Niagara Falls. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how the Slorian rocks and, and Niagara Scarbon impact the state. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of other things. I'm going to talk about, um, um, this is more about how they impact the state. I'm going to talk about research that was done on these Slorian rocks, historically important research, some of it done right here by former people of this university. And I'm going to talk about some of my current research that also involves these rocks. So those will be three things. So I'm actually giving three talks in one. So you're getting a bonus, I guess, of some sort. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, the Silurian. The Silurian is a time period, a geologic time period that began about 440 million years ago and ended about 414 million years ago. If you uh, know anything about uh, the geologic past of, uh, of North America, most of it was under shallow seas at the time. There was very little in the way of, um, of uh, mountains or anything of that nature. It's just shallow seas, a few hundred feet deep maybe at the deepest. And at that time, uh, what is now, uh, what we're standing on right now, was located about 20 or 30 degrees south of the equator. So we've moved a bit. Um, it always impresses me that uh, a lot of the public knows about plate tectonics, which is the unifying theory of geology. And uh, it's kind of a new concept. When, when I was a student not too many years ago, uh, there was still a debate about whether or not plate tectonics actually happened or what was going on. But, um, being a young person, I readily adapted to it, and I took the winning side, I guess. And uh, as with most scientific theories, the theory uh, won out because the older people died off. That's the way how science works. <laughs> so anyway, so if you look at this paleogeographic map, this is uh, what's currently uh, uh, North America, and right in the yellow is currently the area where the Great Lakes are, and certainly it's located south of the equator. So shallow seas, so what would you have seen in this part of the world at that time? Nothing, it just, uh, uh, if there's land, there's no plants of any kind on it, except for maybe some moss and things like that, uh, but just basically water. Uh, if you look in the water, you find a nice diversity of, of marine life. There's uh, all the basic things you find in the ocean today are pretty much living then. Fish are a little, uh, uh, underrepresented, but uh, everything else is, is there as we kind of see it. And uh, uh, so looking at the state of Wisconsin, our record is, is very biased. I always like to explain historical geology as looking at a book with most of the chapters missing because in, in some random order. Because when you look at a, a section like Wisconsin and you drill holes down into the, uh, into the ground, uh, you're only seeing parts of the, of the history and a lot of it's missing. And in this case, almost all of us missing for about the last uh, uh, 350 million years. It's, uh, there's a major gap there in time. 
But this is what you would see in Wisconsin, and the Silurian is this uh, little area right up in here. So it's about 414, 444 million years ago. Some of the youngest uh, rocks we have in Wisconsin. Everything in Wisconsin is, is marine environment rocks. Uh, the Silurian is uh, outcrops, there's that bedrock surface in, in eastern Wisconsin. Uh, there's virtually nothing else in the rest of the state. All of those rocks are older. There's a few little pieces of Silurian over in the southwestern part. And there's a little bit of Devonian age rocks, the age of fish, that overlies the Silurian in the Milwaukee area. So what you see and what we're going to talk about is mostly the eastern part of Wisconsin. And you can see it's a very distinctive part of Wisconsin because it is reflecting the underlying bedrock geology more than anything. Um, the Niagara Escarpment is this interesting feature. Uh, it starts uh, east of Rochester, New York and goes all the way around the Great Lakes and actually has a lot to do with the current configuration of the Great Lakes, particularly Lake Ontario, Huron, and Michigan. Uh, their borders, their layout is controlled a lot by uh, these uh, Silurian rocks that form the Niagara Escarpment. Uh, this is a more complex geologic map, but here you can see the Silurian is this kind of darker green starting way over in, in eastern New York, going around the Great Lakes and coming down here. It does continue farther south, but it's basically buried there, so it doesn't have any obvious uh, uh, um, appearance that you can see impacting anything. It just gets buried under glacial debris. Um, but it is pretty prominent in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin has the honor, I guess, of being either the beginning or the end of the escarpment, whichever you prefer. Uh, it ends in Waukesha County. So, go back to this. Um, so we got this circular pattern of these rocks, and the basic geology is there's older rocks surrounding this, and there's younger rocks in the middle here, and that's because we have a structure called the Michigan Basin, which underlies the lower peninsula of Michigan, and it's simply a downwarping of the rocks. So if you start over in Wisconsin, you see these soaring rocks in the escarpment uh, run into Lake Michigan. They go all the way down. They end up where there's several thousand people on the ground surface uh, in the middle of Michigan, and then they come back up on the other side. So it's kind of like a big bowl is what you're looking at. And so these soaring rocks are just a, a layer of the surface of this bowl. Uh, we have uh, this little thing called Green Bay right here, which is uh, um, a fairly prominent uh, uh, a part of the escarpment in Wisconsin, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so what's the definition of an escarpment? Um, well, you can't really read that very well because it's cropped off. Um, but it's uh, essentially it's just a, 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 a kind of a simple structure, and it represents actually just a rock face. It has virtually no width. It's just a rock face, and it's representing an edge of outcrop of a specific kind of rock, something that's sort of cliff forming and separating two other kinds of rocks. So the escarpment is very, very thin, but in this case it's one of the longest geologic features in eastern North America. It's almost a thousand uh, miles long, which is pretty impressive. Not continuous, but it's, it's that, that long. And as I said, most people don't have any idea that it's actually there or what it is. So this is a little diagram of escarpment. Uh, the escarpment is these rock faces here. Uh, in most cases, you see an escarpment because rocks are tilted, and in the case of, of Wisconsin and Niagara Escarpment, the rocks are tilted towards Michigan. If you go on the other side of Michigan and you go to Ontario, they're tilted the other way into Michigan because it's this, this bowl-shaped structure. And it forms uh, cliff faces because uh, uh, it has soft rock underneath, so erosion highlights these more uh, uh, durable rocks at the top undermines the softer rocks, and then eventually you have this collapse. You're kind of renewing this feature uh, through time. It just doesn't form once and, and then never change. And this is just a little diagram of showing you that. Uh, here's the soft rock and the hard rock. And uh, like I said, the escarpment is really just this, this feature right here. Uh, behind that, there's lots of slurring rocks, as you might remember on the map. And uh, that's called the cuesta. It's essentially where the soaring rocks uh, go where they weren't eroded. In this case, they're going towards the east. Okay, we uh, owe a lot to uh, our, uh, our resident uh, first uh, scientist in the state, uh, Increase Alan Lapham. Um, he recognized uh, uh, the Niagara Escarpment in Wisconsin for what it was. It was called locally the ledge back in the mid-1800s and still is called the ledge by locals sometimes. Uh, Lapham grew up uh, in western New York. He was very familiar with uh, the escarpment there because he worked on the construction of the locks at Lockport and the Erie Canal, so he was very familiar with this rock body. And he was observant enough to come all the way over to Wisconsin decades later and say, I think this is 
the ledge that we see in New York, which is kind of a profound thing because it's not an obvious connection. It's pretty far from there to here. Uh, this shows you a map. Here's a geologic map again. Here's of Wisconsin. Here's the Silurian rocks. And if you look at all these little red things here, these are outcrops of the Niagara Escarpment going down into Dodge County, and they also go down into Waukesha County, the next county down. But they're basically getting covered as you go south. So up in Door County, there's not a lot of glacial debris in Door County. It's been pretty much cleaned off by glaciers. They came down and dumped all this stuff uh, to the south, which obscures uh, the escarpment as you go farther south. Um, uh, the one thing I want to talk a little bit about is we have these Silurian rocks, but if you go west, we have Ordovician rocks, which are older, and they're also softer. So there's a reason why there's an escarpment in Wisconsin or uh, throughout the, uh, the Great Lakes area, and that is because you have hard rocks like the Silurian in the middle of two softer bodies of rocks. And so these softer bodies of rocks, like these Ordovician rocks in Wisconsin, erode away more quickly because they're soft, shaly things. And that's what's giving the escarpment uh, its, its uh, topography. It's, uh, this, uh, if you go on one side, you look at this cliff face and everything is rolled away real easily. If you go on the downslope side, there are shaly beds there, you don't get a cliff face, but they also form a depression as you go, keep going farther uh, to the east. Uh, this shows up very well. This is a whole cross section uh, going through uh, Green Bay. So here we have the Silurian rocks tilting into Lake Michigan. We have these Ordovician rocks uh, uh, that have been eroded away in Green Bay. And of course, if you didn't have uh, these Silurian rocks here, you wouldn't have a Green Bay. And of course, that means you wouldn't have Green Bay Packers because there wouldn't be a city there. You need the bay there to make a city. So we owe a lot, I guess, if you like the Packers, we owe a lot to uh, uh, the Niagara Escarpment. Uh, so this is another diagram, uh, again, highlighting uh, this, this tilt. So here's the edge of the escarpment. The Silurian rocks tilt towards Lake Michigan. They're eroded off towards the west. And because of these soft Ordovician rocks, you have erosion going down that way and erosion going down that way. And uh, uh, that coincides to another feature, which really highlights a lot of the geology you see, and that's uh, quaternary glaciation. And uh, the uh, escarpment is actually a dividing line between two giant uh, ice lobes that came down uh, from the north. It, it, was, it divided them. They might have been one farther north. So you have the Green Bay lobe on the west side, and you have the Lake Michigan uh, lobe on the east side. So the escarpment is really a, a profound feature. It's really characterizing what Wisconsin looks like. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have Door County, besides the Green Bay Packers. And you would have just a, a, a shoreline without this big projection going out in the Lake Michigan. Um, so uh, I talked a little bit about uh, glacial deposits sort of covering everything. And that sort of obscures our view of uh, things like the escarpment in particular. Because as I said, the farther south you go, the more debris has been piled up by these two glacial lobes running together. And that's forming what we call the Kettle Moraine, of course, and which is a very prominent scenic feature of, uh, of Wisconsin. So that, the Kettle Moraine is there because of the escarpment, even though the escarpment doesn't show up. If you talk to quaternary geologists, a lot of times they talk like all this quaternary stuff is by itself. It's actually controlled a lot by the underlying bedrock geology. And they don't talk about that so much, but... Um, um, so here's uh, an example of the ice sheets uh, uh, that went through this area. Here's the Michigan, Lake Michigan ice sheet and the Green Bay lobe. And again, you can see the escarpment is the thing that divides them. And as you get farther south, the escarpment disappears, not because it's not there. It's simply buried by all this glacial debris from these lobes coming down. Uh, the, this is uh, uh, another map uh, showing a little bit better uh, the ice flow patterns uh, in this area. You can see... The soft Ordovician rocks are a conduit for ice flowing between the escarpment and higher ground to the west, and likewise the opposite is occurring in Lake Michigan to the east. And this is a, a, a nice diagram from Chamberlain, former president of the university here, and his early works are showing this very nicely. Here's the Kettle Moraine, and a nice scenic area in Wisconsin again, and it's uh, actually controlled by the bedrock geology. So um, there's this geologic uh, um, um, underline to uh, the characteristics of eastern Wisconsin and controlling this. And there's a lot of resources and stuff also related to this because 
Of course, resources are controlled a lot of, um, by uh, the underlying geology. So we have groundwater, uh, good groundwater, or groundwater, uh, potential uh, pollution issues and things like that. We have different kinds of soils that are uh, related to farming. We have uh, natural resources like uh, crushed stone and things of that nature. All of these are dependent on this underlying rock. If you go to other parts of Wisconsin, you don't have slurring rocks underlying and you don't have the same kind of topography or the same kind of geography or the same kinds of resources or groundwater or any of those other things. They're all different because they're controlled by these geologic features. Um, so why is this important? Well, historically, uh, the Great Lakes and the Escarpment are very important because it was uh, uh, this, um, one of the ways that the French tried to keep control of North America. Uh, they had settlements along the uh, uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, of course, and uh, River, and uh, uh, they were trying to connect with land that they controlled uh, in the south uh, at New Orleans. So initially they were um, exploring uh, towards the west because they were trying to find the Pacific Ocean, but uh, with uh, the exploration by uh, Marquette and Joliet uh, in the 1670s, uh, they made a big loop coming down through uh, this area of Wisconsin, came down, went on the Mississippi River, realized this isn't going to the Pacific, came back up and then went through um, probably the most important place in the entire Great Lakes, which is Chicago, because of uh, the portage and connection with the Mississippi River uh, drainage and the Great Lakes uh, system. So this was a very important place. And even in the 1670s, Joliet suggested that a little canal there could connect these waterways, and that was eventually built in the, in the 1840s. So it was quite a, quite a lag time there. But um, uh, this inspired a lot of the, the settlement and competition between uh, France and, and Great Britain. Um, when those two parties uh, were removed from the area and this became part of the United States, there was a lot of emphasis to erect forts in places like Chicago because the, the United States wanted to establish a presence. They didn't want the British coming back in there and trying to take over. So it was uh, an early conduit for settling, uh, even though it's, um, the waterway there is pretty insignificant. Uh, trouble now, bigger now, but it was not uh, very big, but good enough to portage over. Um, so when they started settling this area, one of the things they looked for was uh, uh, construction materials. Wood was around a bunch of places, clay was not all that rare, but stone, which is the big uh, heavy duty product of those days, was very limited in where you can find it. So as early as 1820s, and this is uh, Henry Schoolcraft talking about what could they do to enhance the uh, the presence at the mouth of the Chicago River, because it would sand over all the time, you couldn't just float a boat down into uh, the Mississippi River Valley. Um, he thought that they could bring stone from Green Bay all the way down there and build an island off the shore and then connect it by a waterway. I mean, a, a, um, a bridge, essentially. And so that was a plan, and it was also sort of the beginning of uh, the stone industry in the, the Niagara Escarpment in Door County. Now, when people think about the early settlement of Door County, they think in terms of, uh, well, wood, cherries, you know, things like that. Actually, the first people that were there doing, doing any kind of significant uh, uh, development of resources were people quarrying stone. The government owned the land, and the government would um, uh, suggest that uh, uh, you go to Green Bay, I mean, you go to the Door Peninsula, and you get stone there for nothing and use it on our, pro on our projects for creating harbors and stuff in various places on Lake Michigan, and that would save everybody money and everybody be happy. So in Door County, you have exposures like this where rock comes right up to the shore. Um, in most of the rest of uh, uh, Lake Michigan, it's uh, pretty sparse, uh, particularly the east side of, the, of Lake Michigan. There's very few rock outcrops, and even most of the west uh, side, the south of Door County, Rocks are so rare to become tourist uh, attractions in some cases, um, so they're not very common. So it was a very important commodity. If you had to build a harbor, you needed stone. Uh, these are some ads from the 1830s where they're, um, they're advertising for people to bid on harbor construction in Michigan and uh, Indiana, and they're suggesting that you're going to have to go out and get the stone from Green Bay uh, if you want to uh, get this, uh, this bid. So there is a long uh, history of, of stone uh, uh, quarry operations in Door County. You can still see the remnants of it now, uh, but it was a very important thing because uh, people realized that 
they could ship stone over the western shore, I mean eastern shore of Lake Michigan. It was real valuable. They didn't have stone. They needed stone to build things. They could burn lime in the Indoor County and sell it to these same people. These are important building commodities that you had to get from somewhere. And because it was on water, you could get them fairly cheap. Uh, initially, there was no land transportation because there was no roads or railroads or anything like that. And even then, even today, it's still much cheaper to ship things like, uh, like stone um, by, sh by ships instead of trucks or, or trains. So it's, it's still the most economic way to uh, distribute this material. So this is a big industry, and at last, and here you can see some guys actually building a, a dock here. And uh, that it was a very primitive operation because they would have to load these boats by hand. Uh, the idea is you picked up rocks that you could pick up. So that was kind of the, the, the goal of, uh, of this, and throw them in the boat. And then, of course, you had to throw them out of the boat when you, when you got there. And uh, cost a lot of money, took a lot of people, but this was the way he did things until about 1900. And finally, um, they had what were called self-unloading boats, and the first one is actually uh, the Hennepin here, which uh, was a boat for the Lakeshore Stone Company in, uh, in down in Ozaukee County, and it later uh, was uh, sold to some of the producers in Door County. And this is a big innovation because this boat, it, you know, you dumped a bunch of stone in there and it would unload itself. You didn't need a whole crew of people to shovel it and all that sort of stuff. So that was a big innovation that came out of the stone industry here. Um, after, uh, um, well, after the turn of the century, the business in Wisconsin started to decline because there was bigger quarries, more uniform rock uh, that were used in the, in the steel industry in Michigan. And so that eventually put the Wisconsin business out of business. Uh, but there are some lasting uh, benefits of that. One is uh, Potawatomi State Park. Um, this land was held in reserve until the 1920s by the federal government in case stone was needed for construction on um, Lake Michigan or any of the Great Lakes if, if need be. Um, and if you look at that place, there's a couple of small quarries there. But what they were doing is they weren't operating a traditional stone quarry. They were simply picking up rocks on the shore because they're all over the place. And that would be the easiest things that they could, uh, they could quarry in those days. So we have a number of state parks that are related to quarries along Lake Michigan, and Potawatomi is um, uh, one of the best ones. This is actually listed, if you look at a list of forts in the federal government in the late 1800s, this is listed as a, in, with the rest of the forts, although there was never a fort or anything there. In fact, there was usually nothing there. So we have uh, these natural resources that are developed in the area, and uh, um, um, iron was one of them in Dodge County. There was a lot of iron produced in, um, um, uh, in some uh, mines there, which are now the biggest, uh, I think it's the biggest single bat colony anywhere, and certainly in Wisconsin. Um, there was a line, which is another thing. This is High Cliff State Park. Um, that was an operation where they were making lime out of uh, the escarpment. Uh, this is the, the iron mines, Dodge County. So um, there was a lot of business there, and it still continues. There are still quarries uh, operating in these rocks and throughout eastern Wisconsin. They're not so much digging in the, in the exact escarpment anymore because people frown on that. And there's no more iron industry, but it's still a big business. Uh, we, have, we still produce lime, and we still produce crushed stone, and we produce building stone from these slurrying rocks. So it's, a, it's a still a big industry. Used to produce a lot of bricks from the underlying soft or division rocks, but those businesses are all gone. So we have uh, uh, the escarpment in Wisconsin. It's, uh, uh, economically, it's uh, changing in its value to the state. It's about 250 miles long. And what we have now is uh, essentially it's becoming more of a tourist attraction. And it's also a, a, a um, more recently discovered uh, natural uh, Habitat that people pretty much ignored for a long time. People never seemed to be particularly interested in what was going on in the escarpment. Um, scenic beauty, of course, is, is one of the things going on. Um, tourists are showing up. Uh, they've been doing it a long time. And that's becoming one of the big major industries. Here's some ladies down in Waukesha County at the end of the escarpment. And, it's, uh, uh, and if you go into Ontario, the escarpment there is... Uh, a UNESCO uh, a biosphere and uh, a reserve, and it has very unique uh, plants and animals. And so the, probably the oldest living things in Wisconsin are uh, cedar trees sticking out of the escarpment. Very 
unimpressive looking things, but they've been around up to a thousand years in Wisconsin, I think, alone, and there's, there's older ones in Ontario. So, um, because of the fact they're on the escarpment, they escape, you know, the logger's axe because they, they weren't very accessible. And, but they're not actually very big trees to begin with, so they're kind of ignored. So the, the downside of all of this is, uh, this is a, a 1969 uh, copy of National Geographic, and it says right here, it says Wisconsin's Door Peninsula, a kingdom so delicious. They also, I think, in that article called it the, the Cape Cod of the Midwest, and since then it's been inundated with uh, people going there and uh, doing things that don't necessarily have anything to do with the escarpment. It's kind of interesting because people go to Door County all the time, they're not looking at the rocks, which is why people started going to Door County, and certainly one of the more interesting things, but they're doing all kinds of stuff around there. So it's becoming a, a major uh, tourist mecca, um, uh, which also has some uh, downsides besides just people coming there. It's, uh, uh, it's also highly developed. There are no longer any large pieces of land either on the shore in Door County or on the top of the escarpment or on the bottom of the escarpment for that matter that can be used uh, to make a park. Um, they have some nice parks up there now. They're heavily used. They're being overrun by people. But you're not going to be able to get any new ones because this is the, what's going on. And what you don't see in this uh, diagram is actually most of those pieces of property do have houses on them. So if you look real closely, you can see little divots in, in the trees there, and then those are all developed. So that's different from Ontario. Um, Ontario, uh, at least uh, in the western part of Ontario, in the Bruce Peninsula, that's pretty natural yet, and, and it's part of a national park system. Um, uh, in Michigan, it's pretty much ignored because it doesn't overlook the lake. The escarpment actually faces away from the lake, so not much has happened there, but in, in unfortunately in Door County, it's um, extremely heavily developed. Uh, so there are a number of organizations that are doing things to um, um, protect the escarpment and try and manage its use. And in Wisconsin, we have uh, two, the Niagara Escarpment Resource Network, which is based, I think, out of the East Central uh, Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. And then we have this Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership, which also uh, participates in some of that. So there are efforts now to preserve like what's left in Door County, but a lot of that has already uh, gone. So... I have to go to my next uh, program here. So I'm going to talk about some uh, historical uh, research that's fairly significant that was done on the Slorian Rocks uh, uh, in Wisconsin back in the 1800s. doesn't have anything directly to do with the escarpment, but it's, uh, it's fairly interesting nonetheless and involves uh, people that uh, used to work at this uh, university. And, um, and back in the 1830s, when the Milwaukee area was first being settled, uh, people came in and looked for rock resources because they needed them, in particular things like lime. And they found some rock outcrops along the Menominee River in the Milwaukee County. It had nice rock outcrops and made beautiful lime, so they opened up uh, lime kilns and quarries. And one of them was at Wauwatosa. And this is the remnants of the lime kilns. This is a picture from uh, the 1920s, I believe. Um, but because they had these quarries around these lime kilns, people started to look at things like fossils and that and, and look at the geology a little bit. Um, one of the uh, uh, most important things that came out of this is they recognized that some of these quarries had lots of uh, fossils, highly diverse marine fossils. And this gentleman right here, F.H. Day from Olatosa, built up one of the most important collections of this stuff, which is now in Harvard's uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology. Um, and this attracted attention from uh, uh, Eastern uh, geologists and such. So increase Alan Lapham again was involved in some of this stuff. Uh, the main geologist at the beginning was James Hall, who was probably the most important invertebrate paleontologist in the 19th century in Wisconsin in, in North America, and uh, uh, and based in New York. And for a while, he was a uh, state geologist of Wisconsin and Iowa and other places. He spread himself pretty much all around, primarily to get fossils for his research. I think it was his main interest. So um, people like uh, Lapham and Day and those people start to collect fossils. Now it's kind of interesting, how did people get these big fossil collections in the old days? 
It was that there was people who had enough money and leisure time, I don't know how much leisure time uh, Dr. Day had, but uh, they could go out and buy fossils from the quarry workers because quarry workers were getting paid nothing. And so if you give somebody a dollar, that would double his wages or more in a day. So they became very enthusiastic fossil collectors. So um, Dr. Day, if you look at his collection, did not, or none of these people went out and actually collected most of that themselves. It was collected by uh, quarry workers. They had to pick up all the rocks by hand and put them in carts or do something with them. So it wasn't steam shovels or any of that stuff. It was all hand labor, so they saw a lot of fossils. Uh, so what James Hall did is uh, uh, he was state geologist for, for a few years in Wisconsin. He came through the area, and uh, he hired uh, one of the students here, a guy named uh, T.J. Hale, and he's from the class of 1860. However, I don't know which, if any, of these people from this picture of the class from 1860 he is. And we don't know what he looks like. And he disappeared sometime around the Civil War, although he apparently wasn't a soldier. He had something to do with the medical profession. So we know a lot about him up to a point, and then he vanishes, and we have no idea where he went. But presumably he's in this picture. So he was a student here, and he was a graduate of the class of 1860. Uh, he did something real interesting, and what it was is he did this map of the northern geologic map of the northern part of uh, Milwaukee County, which is kind of a groundbreaking map for those days. Most people, if they would make a map, it would be for the whole state or some giant area, and he's the first one that actually went and made sort of a limited scale map like this, at least in the Midwest. And this one shows enough detail that you can see different features, like these little red things that you see. Um, these are some of these ancient reefs. And I'll show you the next picture. This is that side view. And so these are some of the reefs that he saw. And he was um, here with James Hall. Presumably, they both figured this out together. But um, um, we don't know for sure if, if one had more of an influence than another. But what they recognized is they had these rock hills. And they had certain kinds of fossils in them. And then they had surrounding kinds of rocks, which were different. And they had different kinds of fossils. So this is sort of the beginning of paleoecology. Most people didn't think about that stuff at all when they were uh, looking at these kinds of rocks. So um, if you go to that quarry in Wauwatosa, here's a beautiful photograph from 1899. And it shows um, uh, on, on the right side, you can see this kind of massive looking rock, which would be the, uh, the reef hill itself and it grades down into well-bedded rock uh, off to the side. So there's different fossils, different kinds of sediments forming the rock, and it changes through this environment. So this was kind of the way they figured out that these things were probably reefs. Now reefs uh, at the time um, were known in the ocean. People knew about modern reefs, but what they saw of them was what you could walk on when the, flood, when the tide was out because there was no diving or anything like that. So they had a very skewed view of what reefs were. They would walk on the surface, see all these corals, and then they go back and look at the, the fossil record. If a bed had a bunch of corals, and they think, well, that's just a reef, although maybe it's just a level bedded uh, environment that doesn't have anything to do with reefs. But this is the first time that somebody recognized, well, we have hills, we have different kinds of fossils, we have different kinds of sediments. We think this is a coral reef. Uh, and the other thing is, too, is uh, up until about the uh, early 1800s, we said reef, that's just a uh, navigation hazard. So it has nothing to do with something growing on the seafloor. It might be, but it's a, a hazard navigation. So they started to call these things coral reefs because they thought that they were being built up by corals. Uh, they had lots of fossils. They became very important for studying the geology and dating the age of these rocks. Um, here's a diagram from, uh, from uh, Hall, and you can see better what I was talking about with on the right side this kind of massive uh, structure, and then it grades into level bedded rock. And this is a matter of a, a few, uh, maybe a thousand feet or something, you can see this change. So this is sort of the key they had to actually recognizing reefs. And as far as I can tell, the ones that Hall described in 1862 in Wisconsin were the first ones recognized accurately anywhere in the world. There's some Germans that did some things. I'm not that good of a German reader uh, to, to know that they were actually doing it right, or maybe, they're, again, they're just looking at a bunch of corals and rocks and saying, well, it looks like a reef. Uh, the next person to do a lot of work is Thomas Chamberlain. Uh, he, of course, was the president of the university here. And prior to that, he was a state geologist in Wisconsin in the 1870s and early 1880s. And he worked on these same rocks. And he uh, elaborated on uh, the work that Hall had done. Again, this is, a, this is a figure out of Chamberlain. And you can see on the right side, you have this massive 
a bunch of rock and it grades into these level bottom thing, uh, level bedded rocks. And this is paleoecology. You're looking at different environments that you can actually see in rocks, which is kind of a novel thing to uh, be going on in those days. Uh, and the last person ahead of the uh, University of Wisconsin connection is Robert Schrock. He was a, a professor in the geology department in the 1930s, and he did uh, a classic paper on uh, Silurian reefs in Wisconsin. And this is that same uh, uh, reef in Wauwatosa that, uh, um, uh, that the uh, Chamberlain and Hall had worked on in Hale. So um, by the 1930s, this quarry was kind of reaching its end, and it finally closed in the 1950s. Um, but the reefs became so uh, uh, well known, uh, they are essentially what you'd call a textbook example of an ancient reef. And here's a textbook showing you a picture of that reef in Wauwatosa from uh, 1937. So if you talked about ancient reefs or slurrying reefs, people would think of these Wisconsin things. So it was a pretty big uh, discovery. And I mentioned that uh, we had these big fossil collections. Uh, Dr. Days went to uh, Harvard. Uh, the Green Museum in Milwaukee has another large collection. And just about every older natural history museum in the United States has fossils from that specific quarry. It also has the highest number of described uh, fossil taxa of any ancient reef, uh, certainly a Silurian reef, anywhere in the world. And it's because these guys were, people were looking at it for years and years and years, collecting everything they could find in it, that this uh, diversity was uh, uh, recognized and understood. So by the 1960s, most of those quarries had been filled, most of the quarry had been filled in, and this is just a part of the, the reef exposure. Uh, but we've uh, had uh, field trips there. It's an international field trip we had of uh, people looking at that reef. And uh, uh, because of his, uh, its historic importance, uh, we wrote a proposal that was approved by the National Park Service uh, designating uh, the Schoonmaker Reef in Wauwatosa as a natural historic landmark in the history of science and uh, geology study. So that's what it is now, and it's also being converted into a park. So it's going to be a park with a fence around it so people can climb on the rocks and such. Um, so it has a lot of notoriety, and I think sometime this summer would probably be when this park will be uh, dedicated in Wauwatosa. So the local community is very supportive of this. Uh, there's a de that development you, you see there is actually called the reef by the developer, and he's donating some of that land, that, that stuff in A in particular, uh, to the city so they can keep it as a park because they can't build anything on it. So. And uh, the city, like I said, the city's been very uh, helpful. Here we had the fire department out um, wasting time spraying that water and cleaning off a reef. So. <clears throat> So then the last part of uh, my uh, triad of talks here is about some research that I'm doing now as opposed to old research. And um, this is mostly Wisconsin-based, uh, but it's also based, it's based on a lot of other places in the Midwest, but it started out of work that I was doing in Wisconsin. And this is talking about uh, uh, extinction patterns back in the Silurian in a relationship to um, environmental causes. And we found, and I work on Silurian trilobites, that's my, uh, my taxonomic specialty. So I've been looking at these a long time, and this is the official state fossil of Wisconsin, in case anybody doesn't know that. So um, trilobite diversity through time. Trilobites are interesting uh, marine organisms. Uh, they were very uh, common back around uh, 500 million years ago, and they steadily decreased from a peak of a little after 500 million years, disappearing just before the age of dinosaurs. Um, so you see diversity uh, plots like this, and it's based on family-level taxonomies. So they're talking about families here, not species or genera or anything like that. It's families. So this shows a specific pattern. Now, if you look at the, the, the boundary between Ordovician and Silurian, you can see it drops fairly radically there, and then it kind of doesn't do much during the Silurian. But what I found in my uh, research is actually doing something very significant during the Silurian, and there's some very profound extinction events going on. Uh, so we looked at, uh, I, I don't just look at trilobites, I look at the rocks that the trilobites are found in, and I can recognize that there's uh, uh, depositional sequences of rocks. In other words, you're getting a succession of changing environments, it ends, and another s a similar succession starts on a scale of uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so this is a thing that repeats itself during the Silurian. And these are separated by unconformities. So remember, we're talking about the Silurian on the North American continent. It's very shallow water. 
Uh, so it doesn't take a lot to make that emergent. All I have to do is lower sea level by a couple hundred feet and it's sticking out of the, out of the water. It's dried land. So that's what these uh, black uh, boundaries are here, is times when you had the water completely removed from at least this part of the continent and it was uh, exposed and then water comes back in and redeposits more sediments. So that ties into extinction events. Uh, we recognized a long time ago that these extinction events were occurring because if you look at these boundaries, you see trilobites that don't change much for thousands, hundred thousand years maybe, and then all of a sudden they're gone and another group of trilobites is replacing them. So it's kind of an interesting pattern. Um, but what we found is uh, looking at uh, uh, chemostratigraphy, you can look at things like uh, uh, delta-13 carbon isotopes and uh, there's a, a very distinctive pattern in these things, in these same rocks, and it relates to these extinction events, and it relates to these emergence events. And so here you can see um, a pattern for a place in Illinois, and you can see these big peaks on the, on the right, and you can see they kind of line up, some of them, with these black lines. They actually line up very well. And uh, so these changes in, the, in, in carbon delta-13 are occurring at the same time we're having extinctions and at the same time we're having water going in and out. So what is possibly driving that? And, and it's a global feature here. You can see the sort of standard curve uh, for the globe on the right side. Um, well, it's, sort of, it's glaciation is what's doing that. So we know now that uh, during the beginning in the late Ordovician and through all the Silurian, every few hundred thousand years or so, glaciation develops and sea level drops. And when the water comes back in is when you get the, these new kinds of trilobites showing up, sort of. So here's an example of trilobites crossing one of those boundaries, and these are trilobites that live in, in Silurian reefs. And you see they look similar, but they're not the same species, and it's, in a lot of cases they're not even the same genera. So you're replacing one group of trilobites by trilobites that look very similar. The environment must not have changed in the sense that there's, they need to uh, evolve into some other kinds of trilobites but they're not the same trilobites. So what is going on with that? And here's an example from a level bottom environment. Uh, the most common trilobites uh, look pretty much the same across there, but they're definitely not the same species. Uh, if we look at these extinction events um, and plot them with our, our Chiron uh, 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 isotope excursions and the sedimentology, we see that they're occurring not when the water drains out and disappears, which you would think maybe that's when they're all changing. It actually changes when the water comes back in. Not initially, it takes some time. We don't know what the time scale of this change is. It's too hard to guess, but it's certainly talking about hundreds and maybe more than that in years. Uh, so this has interesting implications for today because we're talking about a situation that we're living in right now. We're out of a glacial period uh, water is starting to, and the planet's heating up, ice is melting, water is starting to rise, and we're potentially facing a big extinction event because we've seen this in the Silurian at least. Um, so if you look at this, this is a summary of what we see. Um, the ones that are most important in the last half is uh, glaciostatic sea level changes, uh, delta carbon 13 excursions, and these transgressive sequences and the water comes back in. And extinction is near the beginning of the transgression. It's not by the uh, unconformity. And these are cyclic. They happen every few hundred thousand or so years in the Silurian. Now, uh, there's a, another time period when the exact same thing is are happening with trilobites, and that's in the, in the Cambrian and into the lower Ordovician. So that's a lot earlier, but uh, it's been recognized that something like that is happening um, um, in those rocks too. So about 500 million years ago, you're seeing these same kinds of funny trilobite replacements. You'll see trilobites that stay pretty much the same through hundreds of feet of rock maybe, and all of a sudden there'll be a knife edge sharp change and you'll get completely different trilobites in there. So they're following the same uh, uh, pattern. Here's a good uh, example of trilobites in the Cambrian. Now, I should say that trilobites are much more common in the Cambrian, so it's much easier to see these changes. They're actually pretty rare in the Silurian. It takes a lot of effort to uh, document uh, what's going on with that stuff. So um, way back in the 1960s already, they recognized there was this kind of change again going on. And these are just some examples. Uh, here's a, a nice one, though, because if you look at that gray area and you look at the dots, they start going towards the right that's when you're getting into one of these um, 
uh, new transgressions and you're getting this uh, carbon isotope uh, change at the same time. So the extinction event isn't occurring when the water goes out. And it's not even occurring when the water comes back in. It's after some time period when the water is going, coming back in. So we see this similarity between Silurian trilobites from 440 million years ago to uh, with Cambrian and late Ordovician trilobites 500 million years ago. So it seems to be a common process um, going on at various times in the Silurian. We know that during the Silurian it's related to glaciation. There's not good evidence that I'm aware of in the Cambrian that there's glaciation driving the system, but it could be. It simply just might not have the record to show that. So there's this connection. So that starts to bring up the, the question, okay, what's really an important extinction event in the history of life? Is it looking at families which do change over time, or is it looking at uh, periods like this when you get sort of superficially insignificant looking extinction events where essentially everything is gone and then it comes back in a very similar environment. If that's a, a pattern of some of these early Paleozoic uh, uh, events that becomes very interesting. There are times uh, during the Paleozoic, uh, much bigger time scales, when everything disappears and something completely different comes back which is a more profound kind of extinction event. But uh, so this is maybe more of what's typically going on. And so again, what are we looking at today? We're looking at a time when glaciation is, uh, is uh, decreasing, water levels are starting to rise, things are starting to get warmer, and maybe uh, we don't necessarily see it now in marine invertebrates, um, but there might be a big extinction going, on, going to happen with those kinds of animals, with things like uh, uh, ocean current circulation changes or water temperature changes or things like that. That might be something that's, uh, that's coming on board soon. The extinctions we see now are mostly man-made. We're killing things and changing the environment. But um, maybe there's a natural part to this that we haven't seen yet. I don't think we're killing a lot of marine invertebrates at this stage, but there can be a big change coming down the road. So we see these extinction events. They're, they're definitely um, in a long part of, of the early uh, Paleozoic, and uh, they seem to be glacially driven. So uh, with that, I'm uh, done with my talks, all three of them. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. It's a very unusual deposit. It's, um, it's uh, little um, grains of uh, what they call ooids, it's little iron grains. And we find them scattered around throughout a large part of the Midwest, but in very small areas. And you'll just find a few feet of rock maybe that'll have scattered grains in at Nita that are up to 30 feet thick, which is very impressive, and nobody knows why they're that thick. They think they might be related to uh, soil developments and things like that. So. Um, most of these other places that you see, you see them in Illinois and Iowa and places like that, it looks like they could be some kind of soil thing because water has gone out and the land surface is sitting there bare with essentially no plants on it, so you're going to get stuff going on. Uh, maybe the stuff at Nita is a concentration of that. Uh, you know, what, it looks like some of that is, is water concentrated, you see cross bedding and things like that. In it. So maybe that's just a lot of this material that was centralized by water after the water came back in flooding the continent. But there's not a good explanation. Blue Mountains uh, State Park is mm -hmm. the top of that. The Niagara Escarpment also. That's Silurian and it's very unusual rock because everything has turned to chert there and nobody knows how or why that was all turned to chert. It's extremely hard. There's no cores in it. In fact, there's questionable as to whether or not there's actually rock in place. It might just be a lot of erosional uh, rubble because if you walk in the woods and stuff around there you see kind of boulders sticking out. You don't see a, an outcrop of in, in place rock. And people have tried to core that a few times but it's so hard it's, it's very difficult to do. So it's a mystery. But it is Silurian rock. I, I just was wondering what, uh, what type of rock is the escarpment? Oh, well I guess I and say something very specific and important. It's a, it's, a, it's a carbonate. It was probably all deposited as limestone originally, but it's been turned to dolomite or dolostone. So it's metamorphic? Uh, uh, nobody knows exactly how to change uh, hundreds of square or thousands of square miles of uh, limestone into dolomite. 
In fact, everyone's, I mean, you've heard people sort of say, well, it, it couldn't have happened. Well, it did. It, uh, we just don't know how it happened. And uh, there, are play, there are models to do it in small areas, but to cover vast areas that we're talking about is kind of a mystery. Along yeah. those lines, I was pretty interested in the quarrying aspect. Um, are there examples of buildings uh, built with that stone that you can still go look at? Yeah, if you go, Dora County had a very well-developed building stone industry. I mean, they had the, the you know, the, the, the pure uh, construction materials, and they had lime, and they also had stone that they made uh, into building stone. And if you go in, in, in Sturgeon Bay, there's some beautiful buildings uh, uh, made with that stuff. And uh, you, you can go all, if you go to the Milwaukee area, there's a, uh, some rock called Lannan Stone, and uh, the, the city is unique having all of that local stone used in building material. It's slurring, it's not part of the escarpment. And uh, I've heard uh, some of the rock dealers down there say that some of their customers or clients come up from Illinois and are just dumbfounded because there's gas stations made out of the stone, which is so expensive you couldn't do that in Illinois. And uh, well, I don't know if you can do it in Wisconsin anymore either. So uh, Wisconsin is still one of the biggest limestone producers, Dolomite, uh, in the United States. So the biggest one is in Indiana, of course, because they have their operations. But um, so there are ways you can look at, you can go to these communities and see how that stone was used. Cedarburg has Silurian stone that's unique to Cedarburg. Uh, so you can go to these places and see these different kinds of Silurian rocks and figure out where they're coming from in a lot of cases. Yes? I just was wondering, you know, they have problems with water over there where stuff seeps through. Is that due to uh, the escarpment or? The it's, it's due to the escarpment because it's, the kind of rock that a lot of water flows through and a lot of people have their wells in. So if you're in an area where you have a lot of sand and gravel, maybe clay between you and the rock, um, you're not going to pollute it very easily. But if you go to places like Door County, you have a few feet sometimes of dirt over the rock. And so Door County has had uh, a lot of problems with pollution. That's why if you go up there and you see all these above ground uh, um, uh, septic tanks essentially uh, all around there because the uses to dump it in the ground, and of course, and they had a well right near there, and they were making a mess out of the, the stuff. And there's issues in in Kiwani County, the same kind of issues. And uh, so, um, the slurring rocks are a very good aquifer throughout eastern Wisconsin, down into Illinois, uh, but in the northern part of our state, they're susceptible to pollution because of geologic conditions. Again, the glaciers have scraped everything off them, and it's just kind of bare rock. So, yes. Yeah, it, it's it's an exceptionally good building stone. I mean, uh, uh, it's an exceptionally good crushed stone. I mean, the, the big markets for this kind of stone now are not building stone so much anymore because everything is made out of concrete and costs a lot of money to make building stone. But crushed stone is still a major commodity. Uh, each of us uses uh, 11,000 pounds of crushed stone a year. And it's not being dumped in your yard, it's going somewhere else in the highways usually. But it's that's, that's a lot of stone. And that's because they need it in concrete. They need it as aggregate in concrete. And so right now we're still in the Stone Age. We're not, you know, without concrete, we have no civilization. So iron and all that other stuff is superfluous. It's, it's, you gotta have the concrete first. So I grew up in uh, Dixon, Illinois, where they have a Medusa cement plant. Yep. Um, and I'm interested in this lime kilning thing. Mm -hmm. One question is, what do you build a kiln out of that doesn't Um, historically, uh, lime was used as mortar. Cement was very difficult to come by up until uh, the early, literally around 1900s when Portland cement became very economical and they started shipping all around. So before that, if you had to stick uh, rocks together or bricks together, or fill up cracks in your log cabin, you used mortar. And that's what they made, uh, that's what they used lime for. So they burned it in kilns. They would, uh, uh, the primitive kilns would use sometimes glacial boulders of igneous and metamorphic rocks because they're not going to melt, whereas they might build the outside out of the same limestone they were burning in the kiln. 
So if you look at an old kiln, you're going to see commonly igneous boulders. And if it's a real big uh, uh, industrial scale kind of thing, then you'll see fire bricks inside there. So they did that so they wouldn't burn down their kiln. And there's probably people that did that occasionally. But, um, um, and, so, and so up until 1900, they used most of that for mortar. And then the lime industry died pretty much uh, uh, throughout the Midwest. There's, there was thousands of lime kilns all throughout the Midwest, and most of those were abandoned when they were replaced by uh, Portland cement producing operations. And uh, um, it went to a use of a chemical grade lime is what came after that. So we still have lime plants. There's at least uh, two of them in Wisconsin, and they're making some of these chemical grades. They're not using it for mortar. Well, they might use it for mortar, but it's, it's a, a more of a chemically specific kind of material that they're making. You mentioned with the Door County, um, those lime kilns were fueled with firewood, I'm assuming? Was it just straight wood? Did they have to turn it to charcoal? Or? Um, it's just straight wood. So, and they always say that, uh, in, you know, if you look at the literature, people always said that wood made the best lime. Uh, people tried to use coal um, uh, in big cities like Milwaukee and Chicago to use manure, uh, you know, anything that would burn. But, uh, you know, there's always a sort of story that it didn't make as good a lime as, as wood did. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they said. So, and then they didn't make, they didn't make charcoal or anything like that. Yeah, I was a little confused, you know, when you say lime. A lot of times farmers put that on their land to raise pH. Right. Is this the same type of lime or No. <laughs> that lime is this cr finely crushed limestone or dolomite. So, they, yeah, that's uh, as egg lime, and that was something that became real big in the early 1900s because they realized it would improve the yields of the fields, uh, but it's just basically finely crushed stone. Um, I don't have one, but if you go, go ahead. If you can. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, thank you very much.